Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about neurobotics, which is a relatively new field of science that combines neuroscience with robotics. My guest is Yoki Matsuoka. She's a leader in the field, and she was founder and director of the Neurobotics Laboratory at the University of Washington. She's currently vice president of technology at a company called Nest. Her long-term research interest is prosthetic limbs controlled directly by the human brain. Yoki has won numerous awards, including a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers given by the President of the United States. She also has her own nonprofit foundation called Yoki Works, whose mission is to develop ingenious engineering solutions that allow people to overcome their physical or sensory limitations. Yoki has been profiled on PBS's NOVA and has a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. Born in Japan, she once aspired to be a champion tennis player. A series of injuries ended her tennis career, but got her thinking deeply about the mind-body connection which eventually led to her career in science. Yoki, welcome to the program. Good thanks. to have you today. Yeah, thanks, Marty. I'm delighted to be here. So tell me, how did an aspiring tennis player become a scientist? How did that connection work? Well, um, when, when I was trying to be a tennis player and my career started to sort of dwindle in college, I needed to think about something else to do with my life. And when I started to think, I was starting to combine, well, something else I'm good at, which is math and science, see what I could do. And what I decided that I really wanted to do was to build a tennis buddy for myself, which is made of robots with real artificial muscles and then the robotic legs that run around on a tennis court and then have buttons on the body that actually has, you know, how fast the speed of the ball is that day. And actually on the day that I really wanted to win, maybe it would just make it competitive, but just a little bit weaker than me. And on the days that I, you know, I, maybe I'm just tired or I'm mentally beat, maybe uh, I could actually turn it way down and just beat the heck out of it. Did you ever so, work on this robot or did it stay on the drawing pad? Actually, I went a little bit further than just thinking about it. So I helped a uh, graduate student at UC Berkeley build uh, robotic legs. Then I even went on to graduate school at MIT to build a uh, upper torso of a humanoid robot. In fact, I think we have uh, a slide showing uh, one of the robots you worked on. Can we see that slide, please? That first slide? OK, so what are we looking at here? <laughs> this is actually uh, what I've worked on at MIT. The guy on the left is Rodney Brooks. Uh, he was my PhD, uh, master's and PhD advisor who led this project. And then this robot to the right is called COG, C-O-G, uh, stands for cognition. Uh, our goal was to really build a robot that has a two-year-old level cognition and just physical and all the ability. That's pretty smart for a robot. It's amazing. Actually, you know, building a two-year-old spending five years of graduate student's time was really the goal. And, you know, sort of really trying to lead up to the tennis buddy, I was in charge of the limbs. And I started working on the hand at that point. And what I did for the hand for this robot was that I um, first built a mechanism and then hardwire the reflexes. So reflexes are those things like if the, the surface is hot and you touch it and then just let go, those are reflexes. And then babies are born with those things. So I hardwired it and then the rest was all learning, again, just like a baby. Well, I think we have a slide that shows something about those reflexes. There it is right now. Ah, well, yeah, so this one actually shows you how the brain, um, so brain is a nervous system and then it actually has tails coming out of it which goes into the spinal cord and then comes out through your arms and then goes to your muscles and eventually goes to your um, arms and hands and then that makes the motion possible. So that, yeah, uh, but this, that, that slide was just showing that, you know, as we think about moving the hands, we naturally make motion and it's interesting to start to think how can the, you know, the robotics or artificial intelligence really capture those motions. So you want to mimic the human body. The human body is the model and you want to replicate it pretty much. Yeah. In fact, we have another slide which I think shows some of the motion capture. Can we see that third slide, please? So this is a little bit dark, but I think what's going on is that there's some kind of tracking happening. Yeah. So, you know, if you notice that 
most of the robotic device, or even if you imagine how robots move, often they move in a clunky way, right? To the point that when we say, when somebody says walk like a robot, mm -hmm. we do this. Uh, 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 I think those right? old science just, fiction movies from the 1950s. Right, right, and it, it's that's because the robot gets their reputation. It doesn't make human-like motion, mm -hmm. but. What we actually have to do is to capture motion like this and then really try to understand how humans make smooth motion and even come up with a mathematical formula for it. So and that, then So that slide was tracking human motions and then right. when you capture that you know what the robot has to do. Yeah, that's right. So if we could keep track of the brain signals and the motion, then if you try to understand a relationship between them, then we're onto something. Now, you eventually at the University of Washington developed some fairly sophisticated devices, uh, something that looks like a prosthetic arm. In fact, there it is right now. Uh -huh. So that, I guess, is your creation, yeah. more or less. So, so, you know, to the point, my, my passion of, um, you know, just building Tennis Buddy has sort of started to really become uh, obsessive in a way that I needed to understand every detail of what really makes the human elegant motion possible, what learning where the you know, learning really happens, where's the secret sauce? Why isn't that, you know, we've spent a good 50 years to build developing robots, but why aren't robots out there making those motions possible? So we, we even started from bones and tendons and muscles and imitating all those details and then trying to really get down to that level that, you know, okay. we have we one can more imagine. slide. This is oh. our last slide, and so that looks like a close up of the hand of that same prosthetic arm. Yeah, as you can see, you know, those white things, those. We actually took the laser scan of human bones, the cadaver bones, to capture some of the details of bumps and grooves that we don't even understand why they're there. Because as long as we use cylindrical, robotic, metallic bones, we will never understand the meaning of those things. That might be extremely critical. Now, in this type of prosthetic arm, um is it meant to ultimately be used on a person? If so, if you strapped it on someone, how would they control it? I understand that you're trying to figure out how to make it controlled directly by the person's brain. Mm -hmm. Right. So start from a relatively simple way to understand this is that so the human brain has chemical reaction and it becomes electric signal that propagates to spinal cord and to the nerve. And then the, the electrical signal is that arrives at the muscle, the muscle contracts. That's sort of how the brain signal works. Now, the non-invasive way to control the prosthetic limb is to put a sensor on top of the, those muscles that are still there and then trying to capture that electrical signal that just arrived from the muscle, the, from the brain, mm -hmm. and then use that to amplify that signal and then to move the robot. So as you know, we could say, now think about moving your hand, you know, opening and closing without actually doing it. You're thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking about it. Okay, at that moment, now, you're, some muscles, the signals are starting to be sent to the muscles that really allow right. this to happen. And if you didn't, if, if I chopped off your arm, God you, still have, <laughs> you, still, you still have some muscles left, and an electric signal still would be arriving. Mm -hmm. We take those signals, then we make the prosthetic hand open and close. So how does that work? Because you have these nerve cells which carry an electric signal, and you have metal wires which can carry a signal. So do you actually attach the end of a nerve cell to the end of a metal wire? There are many ways to do it, actually. So their level of invasiveness, the non-invasive way is really on the skin, put a little sticker, and trying to capture the little bit of electric signal that's going on inside, amplify it, and then send that through the electric wire. That's a non-invasive way. But going all the way, you can actually have something on, the, on top of the, head, you know, the skin on the head, that's called EEG, or you know, peel the skin off, drill the hole, and then go into the, the sort of the surface of the brain, it's called ECOG, you can get more information. And then there are even electrodes that go right into the brain tissue and can measure that, that exactly what you're talking about in terms of the neurons and neural, you know, nerve signals. Because that and sounds we can capture that. highly invasive though, to drill a hole in your brain. It, well, well, we're not drilling holes in the brain yet, but we're mm -hmm. drilling holes into the skull. Yeah. But it's actually not so invasive. So, so, how, so how far is this from being used? I mean, is it, uh, mm -hmm. is it in the stage where somebody could strap this on and actually move? Uh, yes. So actually, you know, how realistic is it is sort of, I'm going to twist it a little bit. So how realistic is it to have something like that in the brain? 
-hmm. It's actually realistic that it's FDA approved, you know, Parkinson's um, uh, surgical um, treatment includes implanting a chip in the brain. So this actually happens. It goes in and put a chip that can stimulate part of the brain and then come out, seal it off, and then those people who have had a hard time moving can really start to move better. So it's not so far off from now, that point of view. And now, now, if you wanted to do a fairly complex task like pick up a ball with your hand and throw it, mm -hmm. uh, that involves complex actions with a lot of different muscles. Uh, is that one of the goal of this type of prosthetic arm, to be able to do complex motions like that? Yes. Actually, that's exactly where we want to go. Um, there's, you know, going from opening and closing, this is sort of the, what we call single degree of freedom motion. So, you know, open, close, and then we could do that with one electric wire. But if we wanted to do something like this, that requires maybe two electric wire. Maybe you're mm -hmm. doing this, we require three electric wires. Just like that, and in order to do all of this or use chopsticks mm -hmm. to you know, grab ice cubes and then feed it to someone, it will probably require 20 wires. So the goal is to eventually get to the point where we can get that many differentiated signals from the brain and feed it to the prosthetics. Now, the person have to learn to do these functions all over again because a child when he first tries to grab something, he doesn't know how. He uses trial and error, mm -hmm. and eventually he finds a way that works, and then does it so much it becomes automatic, and if he tried to deconstruct it, it would be really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, it sounds like, even with this type of device, you would have to deconstruct the actions and think of each individual muscle that would have to be moved. Actually, you touched the really, really important part. It's really interesting that so now we take, uh, say, a 35-year-old person who happened to, you know, have an unfortunate maybe stroke, you know, early stroke and have a paralyzed limb. How could we actually get them to have to relearn just like when they're one-year-old? It's really hard. Turns out it's almost impossible to do everything exactly how they've done it. So that's where artificial intelligence comes in. So we get people to learn, but also at the same time the machine side is also learning to that person, how the brain signal works. So it's a mutual learning process. Now the whole concept of artificial intelligence is extremely interesting because it seems to me that in trying to mimic intelligence with machines, you would necessarily have to gain greater insight into the way real intelligence actually works. In the course of your research, have you learned anything interesting about how real intelligence functions? The word intelligence is a big one, of course. Um, but the reason why I ended up even studying neuroscience to begin with is because when I was halfway through the graduate school, really trying to learn more about artificial intelligence and how to control robots, I felt that I will never reach that ability to build tennis body with the current amount of technology that was available at that point, especially in AI. So I went into neuroscience to precisely trying to capture what are the ingredients about the human brain and the way we move, the way we learn, that we can bring back to AI. Um, and what did you find out? Uh, it's kind of a good question. It's uh, the kind of things that I really tried to capture was to um, how we learn movement. So he, I'm going to give you an analogy with tennis. Mm -hmm. So when we play tennis, and we say the ball bounced precisely in the same location every time and you learn to play, you know, you learn to hit that ball. And then you get pretty good at it. And then, then the, the coach walks over to the other side. And then now it says, I'm going to toss you the ball. And then the ball bounces differently this time. For some reason, humans, us, we're able to adapt, right? We're able to sort of hit a little bit out of from where exactly how we learn to play. We generalize that learned information to somewhere else. That ability is not really a natural thing in robotics. In robotics, we encode exactly how many degrees that each joint has to move to make that motion possible. And if the ball bounces differently, it's out of luck. So that's sort of something that I've sort of tried to port in from neuroscience onto the artificial intelligence. Now could robotics use trial and error similar to a human being? So for example, let's say you want to teach a robot to stand up from a seated position and walk. Mm -hmm. Like when a, a baby learns how to do that, they don't know immediately it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. So could you program a robot that it knows the full range of motion of all of its own parts, it understands laws of physics like gravity and inertia, 
Um, it knows what its goal is. Its goal is to get from point A to point B, mm -hmm. or its goal is to throw a ball. It can look at the results it achieved, determine if it was close to the goal or not. Uh, if it wasn't good, maybe vary one of the uh, parameters and, and try something else and keep getting closer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. That's kind of what we do when we're learning. And that's what robots do. It's, but now we need to actually pick what's the, what's the goal, right? We mm. need to really understand, you know, there are many ways to achieve the same thing. We can actually use the same hand and an arm and then this mug, and we can drink this in many, many different ways, right? Infinitely many different ways. Um, and somehow, over time, we've learned to use this part, and we've, instead of using all fingers, somehow maybe learned to use few, mm -hmm. you know, three fingers to do it. So those are very interesting observations mm -hmm. of humans that we make and says, why are people picking to do it in a certain way? And what does it mean? What are the things that are being optimized? Is it the energy, total amount of energy that we use? Is it the, you know, the amount of, you know, the, the kind of path? Maybe we take a straight path to get to a place. Um, there are all kinds of, you know, different ways that we can look at how humans compute the motion that it's about to make. So does the robot need to remember what it did before and remember what the results of that action were. Mm -hmm. in order, and, and then you have to uh, program it and tell it what the goal is, whether to you do it with the least amount of effort or the least amount of separate motions. Mm -hmm. or so, so there's a lot of ways. I don't, we're not at the point where the robot can make those decisions by itself, I don't think. Um, yeah, it's, I think, uh, you know, the, so in the spectrum of things, of uh, where the current prosthetic users who are wearing most advanced robotic prosthetic system to where the research is really diving in to find out how to control those things in you know, 20 years down the line. The kind of conversation we're having is this side. Mm -hmm. 20 years down the line, hopefully, where all the kind of research that we are finding out from the field of neuroscience as well as building up in, in, in AI will really try and get to the point where we're controlling what people are wearing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. and now, what's the most challenging part of robotics? What are some of the most difficult problems you have to solve to get the robots to do what you want? Whew, that's a very hard question. I like hard <laughs> but, questions. <laughs> um, I mean, it is... Is it in the software programming? It's, it's in a lot of places. So anywhere from mechanism itself, and material, right? So durable material that can really withstand on a daily basis wear and tear. Well, we do really well with wear and tear. Skins just peel off every day. We just don't know as much of it. But, you know, can we build a material that renew itself so that we can just keep using it? That's amazing. Batteries, power. You know, where can we actually get that energy source in a very light way? Those things are even really, really hard to do. So starting from the mechanism itself, and then onto all the computation side, you know, we're still limited by the speed to control all this crazy degrees of, you know, this, the hand has 22 degrees of freedom. So we have to have ways to control all of them as well as millions of sensors that we have in our hands to return and then compute all of that within, you know, tens and hundreds of milliseconds and then spit the action back. Do you feel the field of Neurobotics is getting all the resources it needs to pursue this research vigorously. There's a lot of competition for those uh, federal dollars. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, I'm proud to say I think that this field is really now it's sort of you know taking off, and from the point of view that um, uh, we in in University of Washington leading uh, uh, in Seattle we started a center called the Center for Sensory Motor Neuroengineering. It's a National Science Foundation funded center. And they're funding the first five years, um, $18.5 million, and it's to continue for 10 years. So it's about $40 million project. So to really get this field going in a way that is not just let's get the prosthetic on people and then you know, just let them do you know let them just do simple tasks but in a way that really leads us to the future path of being able to do complicated you know manipulation of objects to not just running but what if some tiger comes in and be able to turn around really fast 
those, you know, or, you know, running around in a rocky place where you have to adjust your, you know, foot placement mm -hmm. all the time. Those agile, you know, fine dexterity, those things are really starting to be something that we are able to do using. Or maybe we could go beyond funding. normal human capability, get prosthetic wings, for example. <laughs> that would be interesting. It actually would be quite interesting. As a matter of fact, I mean, there is a distinction even in wording between sort of augmentation and enhancement. And, you know, uh, I, my passion certainly is in the area of allowing people who were, you know, sort of not able to do what they really want to do because of some limitations that they're experiencing to become, you know, become basically a full person and be able to enjoy their life. Well, this sort of touches on your uh, foundation, Yoki Works, uh, which is created to come up with solutions for people who have various limitations. How did Yoki Works get started and what sort of things does it actually do? Yeah, so starting from uh, how it got started. So, you know, I was a real researcher belief that if I'm going to be a researcher, I'm really going to push the out, outer boundary as much as possible. So I worked in, in, the, in the university laboratory in a way that really looked 30 years down the line. Um, but at the same time, I was doing this kind of research because I wanted to affect people now. I wanted to see those smiles myself instead of 30 years down the line now. So, so that's where Yoki Works was born. I wanted to, and also I started to get, you know, on the side, quite a lot of emails from people saying, um, I'm, I have these neurological disorders and I'm unable to do certain things. Can you help? And eventually I realized, ah, oh, this might be it. This is exactly where I can help people because I can combine the knowledge of neuroscience and the knowledge of robotics to build something that's useful for those individuals. So how does that work? Do you have a staff of people who respond to these requests? Mm -hmm. We have a group of volunteers who all come with different backgrounds. Some are you know, mechanical engineers, some are software engineers, some are physical therapists, some are nurses, some are moms. And you know, just really those team of players are getting together as the problem, not, not the problem, problem is probably the wrong, wrong word. Uh, somebody comes to us and say, I, you know, I'm interested in having you solve this problem. Can you help? We don't know what to do. Then we evaluate whether that's something that we can do within our team and a budget. And then we build this device and then we get them to try out. Yeah. Are you breaking new ground with this or basically engineering from already known principles? Oh, I think, I hope that we're breaking grounds to the point that um, some of the solutions we're coming up with is something that I've never seen anywhere else. So our volunteer team is doing an amazing job basically developing intellectual properties. Now, there's a huge demand for replacing limbs. You know, in time of war, a lot of people come back missing limbs and all kinds of body parts. Do you see this as a mass production industry where anybody who is missing any limb ultimately will be able to get it replaced very quickly and easily? I think so. I mean, and an even not only visible thing. So, you know, we're talking quite a, focusing a lot on the missing limbs, but missing functions in the brain, mm -hmm. right? So maybe there are some memory augmentations needed. Maybe there are some emotional support is needed. Maybe their, you know, limbs are attached, but they're not moving as well anymore. So mm -hmm. there are all those different kinds of augmentation that is possible. But yeah, I truly believe that, uh, you know, lots of people are working in the right direction to eventually get to the point where people who are, in, you know, if they really want to augment something that's missing, they make a request and then we'll be able to move towards the right direction. So what do you think the world is going to look like in uh, several decades with this kind of technology? Do you think every time you walk down the street you'll be seeing people with these you know, funny looking uh, arms and legs? Funny. And, or, <laughs> well, I mean, some of them don't, don't try to look like the real thing. Sorry, I didn't mean to make fun That's okay. of That's <laughs> okay. No, so for example, like uh, people have artificial legs, but they don't look like real feet. It made it much better, I mean, they're springier, you know, they can move faster than a person with normal legs? Yeah, so actually, in a way, I made fun of you, but the, okay. the part about funny is actually a very important part. So along, one of the effort is to not be funny, right? Mm -hmm. So as we develop all those things, we also have to make sure that the societal support and the, mm -hmm. the value expectation, all of that catches up at the same time. So this is actually really important. 
you know, mm -hmm. we all somehow are hardwired, you know, to look at something that looks different from the norm. So if somebody's on a wheelchair, we don't want to, but we can't help but to kind of try to look a little bit. Um, we want to just stop that. We, we, of course, we need to work towards building something that is so natural that people didn't even realize that it was artificial. But at the same time, people should think like, way cool. You know, mm. I wish I had chopped off my arm and then I wish I had that really, really cool arm. And, you know, I think that's another part that really requires education. Mm. Right, that might lead to the situation where a person deliberately has his legs amputated and replaced so he can be a more competitive Olympic runner. I mean, that would probably have to be illegal. Yeah, that probably has to be illegal. Like but, steroids. Yeah. I think, I think there's going to be a lot more of those people who will be accepted and rules are going mm. to change a little bit. I mean, golf clubs, rules, you know, mm. change to adapt to some of the technology advancements. Now, does this affect how we think of ourselves as human beings if, we ma if we're made up of all these extra parts? Does that alter the concept of what it means to be a person? Excellent point. And it all depends on who we're talking with. And I've had, certainly had conversation with people who believe that the moment we replace part of us with anything electrical and you know, metallic, then we're not us anymore. I'm certainly not a believer of that. I really believe that we humans are software and hardware to begin with. That brain is the software and then the, the body is the hardware. And that's how it is. And then if we replace part of it, that's just how it is. No big deal. Well, I'd love to ask more questions, but I've gotten the signal that we're almost out of time. So we are going to have to wrap up the show. I'd like to thank you very much for being here today. I've been speaking with Yoki Matsuoka, uh, MacArthur Genius Award winner, uh, creator of the Neurobotics Lab at the University of Washington. You've won a ton of other awards, which we haven't even mentioned here today. Hope you'll keep up the good work. If I ever need a prosthetic limb for some reason, uh, I'll look up your lab and uh, see what you got. All right. Well, thank you, Marty. This okay. was really fun. And thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next time and visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.